Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our series of interviews with Norman, F Norman Finkelstein. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you so much. So this is an abbreviated biography. Though look below the video player and you'll see the whole biography. Norman is one of the foremost U.S. scholars of Israeli-Palestinian conflict. His most recent book and the latest book is Method and Madness, The Hidden History of Israel's Assaults on Gaza. So thanks for joining us. Um, so we started kind of getting into a bit of your biographical story, but let's go back sort of to the beginning. Um, your mother was a, a Holocaust survivor, uh, and she was, your family came from Poland? Where was the family originally? Uh, both of my parents were from Warsaw, and uh, both of them were in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, the Germans invaded Poland in September 1939. I think the ghetto was built about a year and a half after, if I'm not mistaken. They were both in the ghetto until April 1943, uh, when there was the uprising and then the uh, Nazi suppression of the uprising. The survivors of the uprising, the numbers are something like around 30,000. Uh, they were all deported to Majdanek concentration camp. So both of my parents were deported to Majdanek and then eventually my mother ended up in two slave labor camps and my father ended up in Auschwitz, though as I understand it he was in something like seven or eight concentration camps. He ended up in Auschwitz. He was in the Auschwitz death march. Uh, he was liberated by the Americans. My late mother was liberated by the Russians. And then they ended up in the DP, the displaced people camps uh, in uh, Austria, Linz, Austria, where my eldest brother, Henry, was born. Uh, and then they ended up in the United States. My father was active in the left wing of the Zionist movement, Hashemer Hatzair. My mother, as I gather, she was, uh, both my parents were extremely sympathetic to the Soviet Union uh, to the last day of their lives. They died 20 years ago now, in 1995 to the last day of their lives, you could not criticize Stalin. You could not say one single word against him. What, did they, what did they make of the, you know, the, the critiques or the revelations? They didn't care uh, as far as they were concerned, and it's factually correct. It was the Soviet Union that defeated the Nazis. The whole war was fought in the Eastern Front. Uh, about 200 thousand Americans were killed, about 400,000 British were killed, about 30 million Russians were killed. That sort of tells you the story. On the Eastern Front, it was a war of annihilation, and 90-95% uh, of the troops, the Nazi troops, were on the Eastern Front uh, throughout the war. So uh, as far as they were concerned, uh, the Soviet Union defeated the Nazis, and that's all they cared about. What was I, won't say, I won't say they were narrow-minded. They, they were very anti-war, and they felt that the Soviet, pe the Soviet people understood war, understood what it means to pass through a war. And so there was a certain sense of uh, affinity to the Soviet people and to the Soviet Union. And uh, they didn't care about, they didn't believe the critiques. They would say it's all CIA. Even though my, my, uh, my mother was extremely intelligent, uh, she, was, she was classically educated, knew many languages, uh, spoke, uh, uh, displayed her knowledge of Latin and many other languages, um, and also English. Her English was quite extraordinary. Um, but as I said, the human capacity for self-deception is bottomless, and you could not get my parents to budge on the question of what Stalin. Was their, what was their attitude towards American politics? Uh, I would say, I, I don't want to use such a forceful word as hated, but I, they saw the world through the prism of the Nazi Holocaust. They were eternally in debt to the Soviet Union, and so anyone who was anti-Soviet, they were very harsh on. And, uh, you know, I, my parents were real survivors. A lot of people who claim they were survivors of Nazi Holocaust, complete nonsense. Nazi Holocaust was an extremely efficient, as the late Raoul Hilberg, the uh, 
the chief historian in the Nazi Holocaust, the most uh, knowledgeable. As he described, it was an assembly line, uh, factory-like extermination of the Jews, which meant that very few people survived. The figures Hilberg gives and others who are knowledgeable, like Henry Friedlander, who I guess has already passed from the scene also, uh, under 100,000 Jews survived the Nazi Holocaust. If you define the Nazi Holocaust as the ghettos, the labor camps, and the concentration camps, if you, if that universe, if that's what it means to pass through the Nazi Holocaust, um, about uh, under 100,000 survived. So we're talking about a very small number. My parents were among those. When my parents were growing up, uh, their, you know, their uh, community of friends were mostly people who they knew before the war or people who somehow came home over after uh, World War II, but were from Europe. Uh, of all my parents' friends, of all of them, my parents were the only ones that were in the camps. Mm. They had one friend who was kept by what was called, by, I'm using their language, a Christian family in Poland, a lot who fled to the Soviet Union from Poland uh, and survived that way. Uh, the only ones who were in the camps well, were my parents. What was their attitude to the creation of the State of Israel? Um, the Soviet Union, if I understand it correctly, cast yeah, the first vote and, in favor. And they, and, and they felt a lot of affinity for Gromyko's speech. Uh, the foreign minister at, at the UN, Gromyko, he actually uh, delivered a very moving speech uh, in support of the Jews have earned a right to a state. Uh, but as far as my parents were concerned, Israel then quickly sold its soul to the West and my parents would have no truck with it. They were pretty, uh, uh, they were, they had a, it's strange to say, uh, my, my family was, it was odd. They, they had a deep sense of faithfulness. You don't betray friends. The Soviet Union defeated the Nazis. And then when Israel joins with the West in the Cold War, from my parents. That but was the, the ultimate they, but, betrayal. But they didn't Actually, accept just, this idea that this is the refuge so it doesn't happen again. Um, no, I, I, wouldn't, I think they did accept that idea. There's a they difference did. between the, uh, uh, the idea of a state where Jews can go and the state of Israel, the specific state of Israel and how it carried on in world affairs. Uh, they accepted the first part, that after the feeling of my parents was the whole world abandoned the Jews during World War II. I don't fully agree with that. I'm just giving you their point of view. The whole world abandoned them and therefore Jews needed a refuge. They needed a place to go when the moment of truth, if and when it came. So they accepted that idea. If, they, if you asked, as I, as I did, if you asked, then do you accept that this state has the right to discriminate against non-Jews, well, no, that, that's, you, you couldn't even argue with them. About, there was no point in arguing. Of course, they rejected that idea. So if you ask, how can you support a Jewish state if by Jewish state it means that non-Jews are discriminated against, all the way my late mother uh, dealt with contradictions was to say, quote, get away from me. <laughs> You don't want to argue, you know. <laughs> it's one of those contradictions that you can't resolve in your mind. It's not easy to resolve on paper either, uh, even if you've thought about it for a long time. So they accepted that idea. What they rejected was its practical manifestation, namely the actual state of Israel, because it aligned itself with the West. You know, um, my parents could easily have made a small fortune, not a big fortune, uh, by hawking their Holocaust pedigree. Uh, but, uh, and they were not indifferent to money, let's be clear about that. But they would never in public say anything against the Soviet Union. And that was a requirement at the time because we're talking about the 1970s and 80s 
with the whole free Soviet Jewry movement, and you were supposed to denounce the Soviet Union as being anti-Semitic, and so on and so forth. So in order to hawk your Holocaust credentials, you had to, at that time, denounce the Soviet Union. Impossible. Mm -hmm. They would never. They had that level of uh, faithfulness and um, gratitude. I mean, it's a strange thing to have to say, but they had a sense of gratitude to Stalin and faithfulness. And how, and how early in, in the development of the State of Israel do they become oh, mo mostly early, critics because, of Israel? No, very early, because Israel officially aligned itself with the U.S. at the time of the Korean War. And it was the issue of, of the uh, uh, expulsion of Palestinians yeah, well, an, an it, issue? It, or it didn't was exist. Nobody knew. Nobody knew in the West that Palestinians even existed. My parents didn't know. Most people who were, you know, in Europe and coming over, they didn't know anything about Palestinians. So do you, as you become more politically conscious, mm -hmm. I don't know, as you hit 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, I guess somewhere in there. Well, that's a little early, early but not so early. I was already... Because you're growing up in a pretty political household, it sounds. Completely political. How our household consisted of Sunday morning, you divided up. I'm serious. It's weird now to think about. You divided up uh, sections of the New York Times over the, uh, over the breakfast table. My father would always ask for, I remember, he said, give me the illustrated. The illustrated meant the magazine section. Um, and each person would take a section. What section did you get? No recollection. If you want to know, I, I don't recall. But I remember all the time talking about politics, in particular uh, the war in Vietnam. So it, Actually, my parents got nervous. I remember, uh, okay, 1964. And you're, born, you're born in 53? Yeah. In 64, when Johnson is running for president, I was in sixth grade at the time. He was running against Goldwater. And they were you know, very anti the Vietnam War at an early time. When it, before it was popular, uh, they were very anti the Vietnam War. And of course, I used to just repeat what they said in class. I, I didn't know. And I remember once there was supposed to be a debate, and I had myself all primed with statements from my parents about the Vietnam War. And I remember my parents got nervous because they, they weren't paranoid, but they were scared. Uh, they wouldn't sign. They were scared of secret police and CIA and FBI. Uh, of course, they lived through the Rosenbergs. And um, I remember my father Quick, once... Quickly for younger people that don't know, like mm -hmm. three sentences on who the Rosenbergs uh, were. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were uh, Jews from the Lower East Side, accused of being spies for the Soviet Union, became an international cause celebre. Uh, and they were eventually executed by Eisen, under Eisenhower. Um, incidentally, it was all Jews who sort of involved themselves in the process. The first judge was Irving Saypool, then Judge Kaufman. Prosecution was Roy Cohn. They made sure it wasn't anti-Semitic. So this put a scare in them. And so when yeah, it comes they, to you they, speaking about and Vietnam... They wouldn't, and they wouldn't sign a petition you know, because they were afraid, even though, th of course, they felt deeply for the Rosenbergs. Um, mm. When my father came over, one of the conditions for coming into the U.S. is you had to sign a statement saying you would fight for the U.S. in the event of a war with Russia. He signed it, but he was very pained by having to do that. And so they were, got very nervous, and I remember we were standing in the kitchen and I was reciting my arguments, and all of a sudden, my mother and father started to say, but you better say some arguments in favor of the war. <laughs> Where did that come from? I mean, for Christ's sake, I mean, the way they talked about the war, and, and they didn't. War was not an intellectual matter in my home. It was, uh, they hated intellectualizing the war. They hated, uh, you know, I remember Allard Lowenstein. He used to appear on, uh, uh, with Bill Buckley in Firing Line. 
And Lowenstein was, quote unquote, against the war. Buckley was, quote unquote, for, well, he was for the war. But at the end, after the, the debate ends, they get up and they hug each other. And I'm like, what's that? What are you, you're talking about war. You're talking about death, destruction. Yeah. I had that same feeling so, last night. I was watching the uh, final show of Colbert. Uh -huh. And Henry, Henry Kissinger's there singing along with everybody, sort of a goodbye mm -hmm. song. And right. well, there were several, several war, war criminals singing along there. Chomsky used to call him the doctor of death. Yeah. So uh, even when I was in high school, I was on the debating team. And the art of the debating team was they would give you a, what was called a resolution or a proposition. And you had to be equally adept at arguing both sides, you would come in and they would tell you, you're going to argue the affirmative or you're going to argue the negative. And my mother, she was really, uh, <laughs> she was against it. She said, that just teaches you to be two-faced. I don't really agree with her now. There is a value to that, the devil's advocate and learning, understanding every aspect of your argument uh, before you take a side. So hearing out the devil's advocate. But it was also true. It did teach you to be two-faced. Both of those facts are true. And there was, as I said, there was this deep conviction. You had to be faithful to a cause, truthful to a cause. A cause is not something intellectual. It's something about death and destruction. Uh, you know, sometimes if I would talk in my family about war, my mother would go, what do you know about war? Which was true. Really, what did I know about war? So um, these were not intell uh, intellectual matters. Uh, as I said, my late mother was extremely intelligent, now, did but she didn't uh, teach me how to think through how you make well, these arguments. Well, here's what I was about to ask you. Do you then internalize this loyalty to the Soviet Union, the their attitude towards mm -hmm. Stalin and so on. As you become a teenager, is this part of your identity? Oh, sure. It was <laughs> the stories now are funny. I remember in like seventh grade in my social studies class, we're doing World War II. And of course, I'm defending Stalin, which is like, <laughs> where does this guy come from? My social studies teacher was named Josh Abramson. I still remember. He was an Orthodox Jew. And so he'd say, I, I, I would say that Sylvia, uh, this, uh, Stalin transformed Soviet Union from a backward agricultural country into an industrial country, and there's education, which was true, and there was education and health. And then he would say, what about all the death? And I would go home, I'd say to my mother, what about all the death? And she says, well, that's the price that you have to pay to achieve these things. I would come back, say, that's the price you have to pay. He would say, oh, in other words, you're saying the ends justify the means. I didn't know what the hell that means, ends, means, what, what the hell he's talking about. I'd go home and say, Ma, are you saying the ends justify? <laughs> yes, then in this case, the ends, I'd go right back. <laughs> repeating, you know, what I hear at home. Um, it took me a long time to develop my own intellectual identity, and I would say they are probably the critical, well, there were two critical things. First of all, I became ideologically blind, and I paid a, a huge personal price in it because okay. I... Mm -hmm. We're going to do that in the next segment, mm -hmm. because uh, as you said in part one, you become a Maoist, but one of the things about being a Maoist is critiquing the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to that in the next segment of our series of interviews with Norman Finkelstein on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.